Well, glory to God. It's such a wonderful pleasure and privilege to be here with you today in the World Challenge Chapel. For everyone watching online or on YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be dealing with just a few verses, verses 33 through 37. And today's message is titled, From the Abundance of the Heart. From the Abundance of the Heart. Matthew 12, 33 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, I pray, Lord, as your spirit empowers us, draws us, opens our eyes, convicts us of sin. God, makes us clear, God, Lord, clearly understand who we are and what you are doing in our lives. God, I pray at this moment your word will be like a double-edged sword empowered by your spirit that, that cuts us, Lord, open and lays us bare, dividing the, the soul and the spirit, God, the bone from the marrow so that we can see the intentions of our heart, God, and, and you can make us and change us, make us more like you, God. Lord, I pray that we would examine our, our mouths, God, our language, the things we say in front of people, the things we say behind people's backs, realizing, God, that we won't be judged for every evil word or for every vindictive word or every untrue word, but the word of God says for every careless word. So God, let that prick our hearts and open our eyes and find our dependence in you that we might repent, God, that we might be humble and contrite. And Lord, that our mouths might be in evidence that there is in fact a good treasure in our hearts, God, the treasure of you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, after rebuking the Pharisees for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Jesus takes an opportunity to teach on the power of the tongue. As they had done several times before, the Pharisees had indicated or damned themselves. They've, they really indicted themselves by their own words. Like Jesus at this point in his ministry, as he is rebuking and calling out the Pharisees, he's very often just taking their own words and turning them against them. He's not even being that clever. I mean, last, in our last sermon, they were telling Jesus that surely you can't be the son of God because you're casting out demons by the devil. They were saying some very foolish, very unbiblical, very illogical things. We see as the fame of Jesus's ministry grew and his miracles increased, it became more increasingly difficult to deny his claims that he in fact was the long awaited Jewish Messiah, Jewish King and Savior of the world. In their effort to reject him, the hearts of the Pharisees had grown increasingly harder and harder. Their once veiled attempts to discredit him and neutralize him because they perceived him as a threat. This seems to give way to more open, sort of just unveiled assaults on him where they start planning and saying, how can we kill this guy? Like the only reason they hadn't seized him at this point was twofold. One is Jesus said, nobody can take my life. Only I can lay it down. His time has not yet come. But the other reason, the more pragmatic reason of the Pharisees was the fact they wanted to keep the affections of the people. And it was really hard. How are we gonna take this guy and kill him when, when people are starting to say, this guy might be the son of God. I mean, golly, he opens blind eyes. He raises the dead. And he claims to be the long-awaited Messiah. 
At this point, the, the Pharisees' attacks on Jesus were unveiled as their anger read a, reached a fever pitch. The veil was torn off and they were just desperate to get rid of him. They openly called God's mighty works of mercy, compassion and grace, demonic, calling Jesus a demon, doing the work of the devil. This was not the only time the Pharisees had done this, by the way. In one encounter, after running out of arguments that had any logical continuity to them or any theological or an intellectual um, bearing or, or truth, they came to the point where they just resor resorted to slander and insults. Like we can't, we can't out debate you. We can't out talk you. We can't trap you. We can't deny your ministries. So now we're just going to insult you. In John 8, 47 through 48, Jesus says, whoever is of God, hears the words of God. The reason why you don't hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answer him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So basically, they have nothing left to say. So they hated the Samaritans, so they give a racial slur and an insult. Aren't you, listen, don't listen to this guy. He's just a demon-possessed Samaritan. Like they can't, even, they can't even logically debate him. And these were the most intelligent people of the Jewish and uh, academia and the law and the temple. After the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the devil, thus exposing with their own words, the condition of their hearts. He takes the opportunity in this text to give one of the most sober warnings meant to expose the true nature of man's heart. J.C. Ryle in his famous book, Old Paths once said this, let your Christianity be so unmistakable your eye so single, your heart so whole, your walk so straightforward that all can see you have no doubt whose you are and whom you serve. This is being light in the darkness, being singularly fixated and dependent on God and his word. Listen, people might reject me. People might um, persecute me and slander me but I don't wanna give them accusations to do so with my words or with my life. If I fall short, I wanna be quick to apologize. Listen, if I mess up and, and, and do something that doesn't bring glory to God, I wanna make it clear that I'm a fallen human, but the, the pattern of my life, my way of walking as the Bible often says, needs to be evidence of who I am inside. This should be my actions, my deeds, but also the words of my mouth. You can call yourself a Christian. You can go to church. You can have a fish bumper sticker on your car. You can have a Caleb t-shirt. Like the Pharisees and the priests, you can have a vocation or a title that makes you an expert or an authority on God according to the world. But eventually your mouth and your life will either bear witness to your profession of faith or it will deny it. If you wanna know who a man truly is, let him speak freely from his heart. And if you let him talk long enough eventually and without his consent, he will reveal his allegiances and the intentions of his heart. Here Jesus gives a powerful parable that explains the truth about the hearts of men. Verse 33 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Jesus uses this short parable to illustrate a maxim that is simple. It's simple and it's true and it's easy to understand. This biblical maxim is not some paradoxical mystery. This is a plain truth. He just wants to say, look at the Pharisees. Look at yourself. Listen, either you're a good tree bearing good fruit or you're a bad tree bearing bad fruit. A tree is known by its fruit. These men would have understand very quickly what he was saying. See, the Pharisee, Pharisees gave a flawed and illogical assessment of Jesus that really didn't make any sense. The idea that Jesus was casting out demons by the devil really 
makes no sense. And Jesus gives another parable that we studied last week to explain how illogical and absurd that actually is. They were trying to undermine and criticize the root of his ministry because they could not deny the fruit of it. Let me say that again. They went in to attack or undermine the root of his ministry, who he was, because listen, they couldn't deny the fruit. And Jesus says, listen, the fruit will produce what is actually true. From the abundance of the heart, a man speaks from a good tree bears good fruit. By its fruit, you will know what kind of tree it is. And now Jesus turns this logic back on them and he uses it as sort of an ultimatum, not necessarily for the Pharisees, but for all who were listening to him. The words and religion of the Pharisees were inconsistent. They supposedly were looking and anxiously awaiting for the Messiah. This was their, their supposed profession. They, they recited the prophecies. They spoke the words of God but they were inconsistent and their tongues and their actions said something completely different. Like they would profess in the temple that they are waiting on the Messiah to come, but the way they treated him showed that they had no interest in him coming. They weren't really looking for him. And Jesus isn't necessarily trying to win the Pharisees over here. He's using what was just said by them to draw a line in the sand for every person who was following him. Someone can say anything they want. You can say anything about anything that you want with the words of your mouth, but your actions will eventually verify or refute if those words are true or if they're really in your heart. Eventually your mouth will expose who you really are inside. Jesus points this out and says, this is something that is always true. A tree will always produce their fruit after its own kind. And it cannot do anything else. And this goes to the heart of what Christianity really is. This is not a legalistic exurbances of morality and actions we do to be justified before God. This is a rotten tree that's producing rotten fruit. And Jesus is saying, when he comes into our lives and transforms us, a new tree is planted. Yes, there is an old dead tree and it's dying as we mortify our sin and as we grow in Christ. But this new tree is growing up and bearing evidence that we are in fact in God. You can tape pears to an apple tree, but in due time, it will reveal all on its own that it in fact is not a pear tree, it is an apple tree. You can keep an apple tree so well pr pruned and manicured that, you, that people walking by never see the apples, but let it go long enough and you will see that it is an apple tree. And even when you cut the apples off before anyone can see them, it's still an apple tree. It was born an apple tree and it will die an apple tree. I like the idea of taping pears on an apple tree. It's sort of funny sounding, but this is really a, a catechism song that me and my wife teach our son. And on a different note, if you're not catechizing your kids, you should be. You should be walking your kids through the principles of who God, God is from a very early age. My son is two. He can tell you who made him, that no one made God, that God is three persons, that the spirit of God leads us to repentance. And he also knows that an apple tree cannot bear pears, cannot bear bananas. More specifically, Jesus wanted to show the absurdity of the Pharisees' previous statement. Sickness and death are a result of sin that came into the world, are a result of the work of the devil and man following and obeying the devil at the expense of God's word. Sickness and death are a result of sin, which the people he was speaking to should have been well aware of as Jews who had remission sacrifices for their sin all through the year. 
In fact, they had an over, not only did they know this, but the problem wasn't just that they weren't living for God according to his word, but the Jews of the first century had a very superstitious outlook on what religion was. They, they really were superstitious as a people. So for them, they had a superstitious view of this concept. Demon possession is obviously from the devil. So the forgiveness of sin and the signs of Jesus and in his ability to forgive sin, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, this could not be from the kingdom of darkness. This is the fruit of Jesus's tree. So Jesus exposes the half-heartedness, but really the hard-heartedness of the Pharisees and the absurdity of their logic. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He draws a line in the sand for all who are listening. The preaching of the truth and the biblical Jesus always calls the listener to a decision, always draws a line in the sand. The person and the claims of Jesus cause people either to accept or reject. Hear me, new, neutrality is a myth. C.S. Lewis, in one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books, Mere Christianity, really talks about this, this trichotomy, this sort of, this understanding of, of who Christ has to be or cannot be. Listen to this quote from Mere Christianity. He says, I'm here trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on one level, the man was saying uh, that he has, excuse me, who says he has a poached egg or else he is a devil from hell. You must make your choice. Either the man was who he said he is, the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let this not come away from this. Let's not come away with a patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. C.S. Lewis. And this has been summarized and, and, and spoken many, many times. Either he is a liar, either he is a lunatic, or in fact, he is Lord. See, obviously the Pharisees were maddened and angry and they were dead set on destroying him, but they had abandoned reason and logic to do so. Their hard-hearted state had actually caused them to resort to ridiculous claims and slander. They were just basically hurling insults at him at this point. Jesus doesn't want the average bystander to walk away from this confrontation and still feel good about themselves. Here's the thing. Jesus had re rebuked, embarrassed, and exposed the Pharisees. And now he's saying, listen, you are wrong about who I am, and here's why. But there's this whole crowd of people that are following Jesus, and he doesn't want them to walk away thinking that they can feel good about themselves, that they can walk away and say, yeah, this guy, I'm not sure if he's the son of David, but he is a good teacher, and I guess he's a healer of some kind. Like he's saying, listen, either I'm the Lord or I'm not, but here's the evidence that I am. He did not want to let the crowd off the hook. They were speculating amongst themselves, maybe this is the son of David. But they would probably most likely settle in another place, a less dramatic place, a less um, like paralyzing sort of uh, exposing place because they didn't want to be re rejected by their culture. Surely he's a prophet from God or maybe a good teacher or something else. But anything else didn't require complete surrender, complete uh, worship. See, that's the problem with many people today. They want to give Jesus a little bit, but they don't want to give him everything. He's not asking. He don't care if you think he's a good moral teacher. 
He doesn't care about any of these sort of middle places. There aren't middle places. There's in Christ and there's outside of Christ. There is no middle ground. There is nothing neutral. You're for him or you're against him. So many people then, but so many people today know so much about Christ. They know so much about who the Bible claims Christ is, but still they deny him. Unlike the Pharisee or the atheist who has determined to harden their heart towards God, they believe there is something less than surrender that Jesus will accept, but something more than denial. So I'm not denying you, but I'm also not completely accepting you. And Jesus says, there is no such category. Either you're with me or you're against me. This seemingly comfortable, safe middle place is without consequence in their minds, but it simply does not exist. That comfortable place where you can't be a fool among men, that comfortable place where it's Jesus or nothing, that comfortable place does not exist. And Jesus is constantly pointing that out as he preaches the truth. In verse 34, Jesus says, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I don't accept your half measures. I don't accept that. Listen, how can you speak any good when you're evil? From the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. You can pretend, you can give false claims, you can give false um, reasons why you're not gonna follow me, but I know the real reason why. It's because your heart is wicked and dark and you are evil. The only way to be made clean is to bow before me so that I might forgive your sins. Jesus here circles back to the Pharisees and makes a direct judgment on their character, their intentions, and their actions because he knows their heart, because he in fact is God. The phrase brood of vipers is beyond calling someone a bad tree. So everyone under the sound of my voice, he's saying, listen, either you're a good tree or a bad tree. You're with me or you're against me. But he says, you Pharisees are bad trees. You are wicked and evil, but you are a brood of vipers. A brood of vipers is even beyond calling someone a bad tree, using the same phrase that John the Baptist used when he rebuked the Sadducees and the Pharisees when they came out to his baptism. He rebukes them the same way here, Jesus does, and also when he's rebuking them and woeing them in Matthew chapter 23. A viper is a generic name for many different kinds of poisonous snakes that were all around Palestine and the Mediterranean. The snake is a reviled figure in the Bible. And it was uh, because it was through the snake, it was through the serpent that Eve was deceived and Adam sinned and the world was plunged into separation from God. It was the devil taking on the form of a snake. Snakes are cold blooded. They have no emotion or care. They are predators and they have no redeemable qualities. Vipers are deadly, but what also makes them dangerous is they're very deceptive. They can hide behind or blend into their surroundings. They can be hard to see and they can strike quickly with deadly force. A mother viper will lay a large number of eggs, a brood as it's called, in the smallest, the, the, the smallest most concealed place. There's nothing worse than, than opening something up and finding uh, a, a newly hatched snakes in a mother snake. That's a dangerous place to be in. And this brood of vipers, these baby snakes that were born from a mother snake, listen, although they were small, they were very venomous and very dangerous. When there's a brood of vipers, a group of snakes, it's a very dangerous and deadly situation. The Pharisees typically traveled places in groups so that they might inflict their venom on others and that they would find strength in their numbers. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you're cold-blooded, you're selfish, you're venomous, you're deceptive, and you are dangerous. Here Jesus is applying this statement to the Pharisees, but in actuality, this principle 
applies to everyone. In the scripture, the term the heart speaks about the core seat or the core reality of a person. The Hebrew thought regarding the heart represents the seat and thought or the seat of man, which is his thoughts and his will. Not the seat of emotion. Many people like to talk about the heart. In fact, often people will say, listen, that guy really preaches for the heart. What they really mean, though, is he is preaching to their emotions because it stirs them. There's nothing wrong with being emotionally stored. But but speaking to the heart is speaking to the core reality you're dealing with. And sometimes it's not filled with emotive response. Speaking to the heart today, we typically mean that it makes us feel good or or makes us feel happy or makes us feel safe. He's, He's a very heartfelt words. But listen, Jesus is speaking to the heart of man when he says, come all who are weary and heavy laden. I'm forgiving. Listen, I'm lowly and gentle. He's also speaking to the heart of man when he says, you brood of vipers, who who warned you? He's dealing with people where they are. And this has little or nothing to do with our emotions. Today, people often say something touches their heart because it stirs their emotions. But we got to remember the heart is who you actually are. This is why James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in his epistle, James 3, 2, we stumble, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what he says is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. Jesus is talking about the fact that our mouth exposes our hearts and his, his half-brother James apparently got the message. He's like, listen, your, your mouth exposes who you really are. Not that we don't ever say something wrong, but if you if you spend enough time with a person, they're going to show you who they are. You let them talk long enough, they're going to show you who they are because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why in the preceding verse in James's epistle, um, the one that comes right before that, James 3, 1, he says, not many of you should be teachers, my fellow believers, because we know that those who teach will be judged more strictly. Why? Because the words of their mouth are affecting the people that are listening to them. That's why he was so enraged with the Pharisees. That's why that Jesus put a, 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 a cord of whips together and drove the merchants out of the temple. It wasn't just because they were selling stuff and they were, they were doing it in a greedy manner that wasn't uh, selling the sacrifices uh, in an acceptable way. It's because they had taken the house of God and made it a, a place of commerce rather than a house of prayer. A praying where man is joined to God, where man approaches God. James goes on to say in James 3, 3 through 6, He says, we all put bits in the mouth of horses to make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what is a great forest that is set on fire by a small spark and the tongue is also a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and in itself is a fire by hell. He's saying your tongue is a fire. It tears things up. It sets things on fire. He's talking about the unregenerate man, but even the careless words of a Christian man what you fill your mind with, what you set your eyes on, what you put in to meditate on. Listen, this is what fills up your heart and it produces hearts, desires. We can pretend and lie and put on airs, but eventually your mouth will reveal what is inside your heart. But this is also true in a positive sense. Philippians 4 Eight through nine, the apostle Paul says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there be anything of excellence, if there's anything that's worthy of praise, think about these things. 
what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Yes, God has transformed our heart. God is changing us and our, our hungers and affections have changed. But it's also important to realize if you put garbage into a garbage pill, there's garbage inside of it. You know, you, you heard the old saying when we were kids, garbage in, garbage out. It's true. Paul's saying, listen, don't set your affections on things of this world. Don't set your affections on gossip. Don't set your affections on things that are wicked and vile. Set your th affections on things that are pure and noble and excellent and worthy of praise. He says, think on these things. And then when you do, listen, the God of peace will be with you. The peace of God will guide your heart and mind. This Truth is the truth of evangelism. So it's true for the Christian, it's true for the non-Christian, but this is also the truth of evangelism. Verse 35, it says, the good person brings out of his good treasure, he brings forth good, and, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. That's what we do when we evangelize people. It's from the abundance of our heart that our mouth is speaking that Jesus is the only way to God, that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Greek word here that's transliterated to Latin and translated as treasure is referring to where we carefully store things that matter to us. And in the case of words, many times the reason we have outbursts of anger or say things that we say we don't mean is because we store these things up like treasures. We know we shouldn't have said it. We know we shouldn't have thought it, but we have been storing these words up for a while and eventually they will overflow. There will be an outflowing of them. This is where we get the word thesaurus in English. It means a treasury of words. The treasure of your words reveals the treasure of your heart. A good person out of his good treasure and an evil person out of his evil treasury. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good tree produces good fruit and a diseased or bad tree produces diseased or bad fruit. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. It says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Let's get back to Matthew 12. Verse 36 says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. I remember the, I can't remember what day of the week it was, but I remember the first time I read these words. I don't, I can't say that about every part of scripture, but I remember reading through the gospel of Matthew and stumbling upon this, this statement that says, Josh, you're going to give an account. You're going to be judged by not the wicked words of anger, not the profane curse words you've said, not the lustfully sick uh, words you've said that objectify people made in the image of God, not gossip, not wickedness. Listen, careless, careless. I mean, that should govern our heart. That phrase right there, God's going to look at us and judge us based on every careless word. You know how many careless words I've spoke? You know how many times I've just said nonsense to say nonsense? You know how many times I've spoke a careless word about a person without really verifying and making sure it was real or true? Just because it was casual? Just because I joined in a conversation? Please don't pretend like I'm the only one. The mouth is a fire that sets fires. It burns things down. It consumes things. It takes things that are beautiful and it makes them not beautiful. It burns things down. James doesn't say just that your mouth sets a fire. It says your mouth, your tongue is a fire. 
What a narrow and scary standard of judgment. We will be judged not by every evil, not by every heartless, not by every manipulative, not even by every lying word, but by every careless word. And this is why. Psalm 1821, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat of its fruits. Now, some of you who come from a word faith background or a hyper, you know, speaking, declaring false version of Christianity have been taught that this means that your words are creative. Like you have the same creative power in, as Jesus does. And so you can actually like bring something from death to life by the power of your words. This is a proverb and that's not what it's saying. But it is saying this, that our words have the, the power and ability to bring life to a situation, to build someone up, to encourage someone, to tell something true that turns someone from their sin. Listen, there is life and death in the power of the tongue. And here's what, what the proverb is telling us, or the Psalm actually. It's telling us that in fact, the reason why people eat from the fruit, people eat from the fruit of life or death is because they love its fruit. People who gossip love gossip. People who tear people down like to tear people down. They like to hear people tore down. That's why we have the saying that says, misery loves company. It's Proverbs 18.21, excuse me. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Listen, we hang around with gossipers because we wanna hear the gossip. We tear people down or listen to people being tore down. Listen, there is power in our words. Listen, you take a young man and, and, and you raise him as his father and you tell him every day that he's no good, he's not gonna amount to anything and that he's dumb and that nobody loves him. Listen, he's going to have some scars. He's going to believe that it's going to tear him down. Just like words of life can build someone up. And not just words of life are always positive. Here's where so many people get into this nonsense. Listen, if it's true, it's a word of life. There was a point in my life where someone looked at me and said, Josh, you're living in sin and your end will be death. They weren't tearing me down. They were reaching out to me with life. They were coming at me with the gospel. Hey, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But if you don't, you'll inherit eternal condemnation. Is it true? That's the most important thing. And why are you saying it? The truth is like a knife. You can use the truth to cut someone and hack them up. Or you can use the truth like a scalpel in the hand of a skilled surgeon who wants to just make the cut big enough where he can do the work. And then so that can bring ultimate healing. People eat of its fruit because they love either life or they love death. Our words have value and power. They can be knives that produce deep scars. They, they can be bricks that build things up. And this is even true when it comes to our own hearts. The things we subject ourselves to are either scarring us, tearing us down or building us up in the faith. Salvation and condemnation are not produced by your words, but your words are evidence of what you truly believe in your heart. Just reciting a sinner's prayer doesn't save anyone. But in true conversion, we do confess with our mouths what we actually believe is true in our hearts. Romans 10, eight through 13 says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who will call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Let's get back to Matthew 12. Verse 37 says, for by your words, you'll be justified and by your words, you'll be condemned. 
is exactly what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 10. He's saying, listen, our words are going to uh, expose who we are. In the end, your words are going to be the words that indict you. Like in the case of the Pharisees, Jesus is literally taking their slanderous, illogical, blasphemous words, and he's letting them indict themselves. Like in the day of judgment, their own words are going to ring back at them. I used to say this when I pastored at Teen Challenge. The words of the gospel I speak to you are either going to draw you into salvation or they're going to indict you on the day you stand before God as they ring in your ears and you remember you hardened your heart towards God's word. Ultimately, though, if it produces something in you, it's going to come out of you. If you really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he came to seek and save that which is lost and that transforms your heart, it's going to produce a way of life and it's going to produce a way of speaking. It's going to change the way you speak. A cup will overflow with what's poured into it. For your words, for by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. The very same words that are evidence of salvation will be the same words that indict others. The aroma of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this message of Christ, the speaking and proclaiming of the person of Christ, our lives and our words are the aroma of Christ. And it says for some, it's going to, to bring them to, a, to life in this life, which leads to eternal life. And for some of them, them same words are going to be from death to death. Why? Because we rejected the very words of God and it's going to produce a heart condition that produces proclamation of who we really are, what we really believe. The very same words that are evidence of salvation will be the same words that indict others. Those who have surrendered their lives because they have truly believed in God in their hearts. The word careless here refers to this, useless barren, unproductive, worthless, and irresponsible. Listen, there is no greater display of this than men who have a form of godliness, but deny its power, who use moral or evangelical or orthodox language, but do not truly have room for God in their heart. I mean, our country is full of people that say Christian-y sounding things who are far from God because they have been conditioned to say these words they don't really mean, but in the dark or with other crowds of people or when they're alone or when they're at the nightclub or when they're doing whatever, listen, it comes out who they really are when they feel safe. Their facade is indicting them. The profession, they say that, yeah, yeah, sure, Jesus is the only way to God. But they don't really believe it. And those words will indict them one day. They are useless, barren, unproductive, worthless, careless, irresponsible. Matthew 15, 7 through 11 says this. Jesus says, you hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a person. What is he saying? He's saying from the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. You're defiling yourself and those around you because the garbage and the evil and the wickedness of your life will eventually manifest through the words of your mouth. Verse 37 in chapter 12 of Matthew says, for by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Paul, another place in the New Testament says this. He basically says, I've got to guard my own heart and work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, lest I be condemned by the words I preach to you. That's a scary thought for me. That's why James, the half brother of Jesus said, not many of you should be teachers. How sad would it be to be condemned by the very words I spoke to all of you? Because inside me, it really hadn't changed my heart in my life. There's no greater explanation of this in the Bible 
than when Jesus separates the wheat from the tares or the sheep from the goats and he rebukes and condemns people based on every careless word they have ever uttered. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There is no more careless word you can utter than a false profession of faith. Listen, if you're new to Christianity or you're on the, you're on the verge of surrendering your life to Christ, I'm not trying to make you afraid to utter these words. I'm just saying, examine your hearts. Let's make sure that we really are surrendering to God. Listen, if we really are surrendering our life to God, if we really held him as Lord of our life, he will give us a new hand or a new heart and it will produce clean hands, clean words. See, Christianity is, is about a change of heart. That's why the prophet Jeremiah said this, Lord, give me a, a heart of flesh. Lord, exchange it for this heart of stone. The gospel is about a change of heart that produces a change of mind that produces a changed life. The most careless words we will ever hear uttered are people that casually call on Jesus's name with no intention of following him. There's something even more indicting than that. That's people who preach the gospel, who pretend like salvation are words you recite or a mantra you say when, when, when you come into faith. Hey, listen, don't be embarrassed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one ever has to know. Just text the, text the word saved in on your, on your device. I'm not saying these things are overtly evil, but the truth is if a person is truly being drawn to repentance, they need to declare it. Maybe not in that moment, but at some point they have to say, listen, I believe this in my heart. So I declare it with my mouth. Listen, I'm not against you. I'm for you. I am not scattering. I am gathering. Lord, give me a new heart. Lord, give me a new mind. God, change my life. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. So listen, this is true in the careless words of false professions of faith. But all of us who are Christians need to take careful attention. We need to pay careful attention to what Jesus is saying here. Not just those outside of Christ. We're going to stand and account to God for every careless word we spoke. There has been so many places and times in my life where I've had to say, God, I've been careless. I've been careless with my words. I've been careless with your word. Forgive me. Lord, I need you. I'm, humble me, God. Lord, or when my mouth will sometimes reveal that my heart is not exactly where it needs to be. Maybe because I've been pumping garbage into my system. It's not legalistic to turn off your TV. I'm not saying you have to. There are men that I talk to all the time in my years as a pastor where they would, they would come to me and they'd say, I just can't stop looking at pornography. It just, I just try so hard and I can't. In every other area of their life, there is unbridled lust. They watch rated R shows where, where they're not pornography, but people are doing unspeakable things for minutes and minutes in these shows. And they say lewd things and they do lewd things and they watch and listen to music that does all this ludity. Listen, I'm not being legalistic here. What I'm saying is what you pump in is what will come out. You're actually nurturing the old tree instead of killing it as God nurtures the new tree. Listen, there's no condemnation here. I'm not condemning you because this is something we all have to deal with. We have to all live by our convictions. There are, there are lines I have drawn in my life that maybe you don't have to draw as a Christian, but I had to draw them because for me, this was the only possible way that I wasn't going to continue producing vile things. And so that line may be down here for you and it may be way up here for me but it's because I wanna live a life that pleases God. I want from the abundance of my heart, my mouth to speak a life and truth and things that are lovely and pure and holy. And I wanna think on these things. 
And I want a brother or, or sister in the faith to tell me when it's apparent that I'm not thinking on these things because I don't want to speak careless words, not just because Christ will judge every careless word, but because I don't want to spew death. I don't want to spew gossip. I don't want to spew hate. I don't want to be the kind of person that is vile, that is, that is tarnishing my witness. Some of the greatest witnessing opportunities in my life has been when I've come and looked another person in the eye and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said something careless about you or I listened to something careless said about you. I assumed the worst instead of, uh, of giving you an opportunity. Or I've said things that are, that are calloused, that are coarse, made jokes that are because I wanted to feel the, the, the joy of having someone laugh at something I say. And I do it in a way that, that does not edify God, does not draw people to God. Sometimes I did it in ways that hurt other people. Here's something that's not even just about this sermon, but let me give a, a principle to every person listening to this so that you can draw this boundary in your life. You know, it's okay to joke around and have fun. If you and another brother rib each other and, and, and you know, take some shots at each other, I don't think there's anything necessarily wicked about that, but hear these words. If it's not funny to both parties, it's not godly. Obviously, if it's vile and wicked, it's never good. But if you're having fun at someone else's expense and they're like, yeah, I don't think that's too funny. Hey, that hurts my feelings. It doesn't matter. You shouldn't go, hey, you know, tough up, buddy. No, listen, if it's not, if it's not uh, producing things in them that are holy and purely and lovely, things that are worth thinking about, you're tearing them down. You're not building them up. It's that both people, both people have to enjoy it. And then beyond that, it can't be something that's, that's in opposition to God's word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, he who has ears, let them hear. You know, one way we produce non-careless words is by looking deeply and intently into God's word, measuring our conversation, measuring our relationships, measuring the way we coexist with people based on God's word. It's not careless and vile to tell something that's true to them that they don't wanna hear. That's not, that's not careless and vile. The truth is, is always right if it's done in the right spirit. But every careless word will come back to haunt us. We will be justified by our words. And brothers and sisters, we will also be condemned by our words. He who has ear, let him hear. God, I thank you for this message today, God, as I preached it and as I studied to preach it, God, you have convicted my own heart, God. Lord, you have brought to my mind things that I have said or done, um, relationships that I engage in negative talk rather than um, Christ-honoring talk or truthful talk. Lord, I pray that your word would never stop conforming me to the image of Christ. God, that I would never stop being convicted of my sins. God, that I would, I would work hard at securing a treasury of words inside of my heart that reflect you. God, that bring life to people. God, that encourage people, that bear witness that you are God. Lord, I love you and I praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.